Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jennifer Jackson. I'm a registered nurse and I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary. And today I'm going to talk about my research on nursing labor and what nurses do. I am wearing makeup during the pandemic, which is basically a miracle, so I thought it would be a good chance to record some videos. So this is all based on my um, PhD thesis, which is um, it's available from King's College London. I'm in the process of publishing it, and there's also plain language summaries on my website, and you see the link, link there. I am also trying out uh, subtitles for the first time, so hopefully they work well because I want to increase the accessibility for my channel, but also um, they might create some hilarious meme moments if the words don't translate correctly. But anyway, I'm, I'm making an effort, so bear with me if it's not quite perfect. So what do nurses do? When I say that I study this question, some clinical nurses can accuse me of navel gazing or saying you're not dealing with the important issues. What we need is clinical evidence and better clinical supports. And what I'm doing is kind of pie in the sky philosophy. So I don't see it that way at all. I think that we have a lot of issues in nursing. Um, COVID has highlighted those in a whole new way. So globally, nurses are experiencing burnout, injuries, high rates of turnover, lots of people leaving the profession, fewer are joining. And in Western neoliberal climates, people are trying to save money in government. And so nurses are being asked to do more with less. Outside of the West, there's a lot of health systems that are very under-resourced. And so you end up with a similar situation where nurses are asked to do an impossible job and they just can't, they're set up to fail. So I wanted to ask, like, why is this system not working? Because I think often blame is downloaded onto individual nurses. And I think that is really unfair, saying you need to work on your time management skills or you need to have better coping skills when actually the problem is the system. So I think there's been a lot of kind of patchwork attempts at solutions. And for some people, that's all that's within reach. And, and that's why they would approach those types of strategies. However, what I'm looking at is what's the big picture and maybe we need to reimagine the big picture. So let's think boldly and see. Um, I hope that this presentation may give you some ideas of what nursing, what my interpretation of what nursing labor is and how we can either use that to explain nursing to people who are outside the profession or to have better understanding and language to articulate what it is that we do ourselves. So when I ask the question, what do nurses do? Care for patients. I think care for patients is, is the, the bullion cube answer to this question. Um, however, I'm going to challenge that while this is necessary, absolutely we do care for patients, I'm going to say that this answer is not sufficient. So we'll come back to this after I've discussed uh, my research. So this is my model of nursing labor. This is based on a meta-narrative literature review that I conducted looking at about 120 sources from 1953 to 2020. So that's a lot of reading. <laughs> and this was what I've synthesized from how nursing authors and people who have studied nursing have talked about the type of work we do. I want to make a note that um, I used labor very deliberately. I did not use the word care and I did not use the word practice or anything like that because labor is what you are paid for. And I wanted to very firmly place this in the realm of paid work. So 
we know that historically women's work has been devalued. Um, it has been seen as not something we should pay for. A quick way to see this is the physician, physician salaries versus nurse salaries and look at the difference there. Um, now I know that there's many female doctors, there's many male nurses. Um, those gender binaries might not be the most useful in our modern world. But if we're looking at the historical trends, that's that's a broad, um, if oversimplified view of, of how this how this is currently operating. Uh, I was very inspired by Hannah Arden's work um, looking at labor because she categorizes work as something that has defined parameters, whereas labor never ends. Like labor refers to like an ongoing type of thing that needs to be done. And I don't want to wade into difficult territory, but I value that perspective over marks such as means of production or even something like an Adam Smith, like a supply and demand type of model, because those focus on goods, whereas nursing can, for the purposes of this presentation, can be considered a service. And also within health economics, it's not so much about matching supply and demand as it is meeting as much demand as possible. So we don't want to find a best match. We want to meet all the demand ideologically. Most, I would say most clinicians want to make sure everyone has the care they need. So I hope that by using the word labor, I can firmly place this in like the realm of union negotiations and things of that nature so that we can talk about nurses getting paid for what they really do. So this model looks at physical, emotional, cognitive, and organizational labor. And I'm going to go through each of these in more detail. So physical labor is one of the most widely studied concepts in nursing. And this is because relatively speaking, it's the easiest to study. Physical labor can be seen, it can be counted, and it's something that is observable and that whether you're a nurse or not, you can see it happening. So physical labor can include things like washing someone, supporting someone to mobilize, supporting someone to eat, addressing change, um, a psychomotor skill like an injection. All of those kinds of things are physical labor. So that is where a nurse uses their body to perform a therapeutic activity. So this can include a broad, a broad variety of things, even something like monitoring, like I'm using my ears to hear the sound of the alarm going off, I'm using my eyes to see the patient, I'm using my hands to palpate, all of those kinds of things are included. One thing that's really interesting about physical labor is that physical labor looks at labor in a way that it shows us who is valued in society. And that's an oversimplification again, but it's something that we can use to kind of use physical labor as a way of seeing social values translated into nursing. So I'll go into what I mean by that. So when Goddard was the first author to study the um, nursing work that I can find um, in 1953, and um, from that study, they divided nursing work into basic and technical. And this has had profound, although I would say, I think, unintended consequences for nurses. So from that original definition in the 1953 text, basic referred to things that everyone needs. So support with eating, support with washing, support with mobilizing. Every person in a hospital and every person generally needs that. So it was called basic because of the universality of it. Technical refers to things that are either diagnosis or procedure specific. So for example, if I need a urinary catheter and the person, because my diagnosis um, is one that, you know, monitoring my urinary output very precisely is essential. However, the person in the next bed over might not have a urinary catheter based on their diagnosis. So technical reflected the connection between the diagnosis and the skill, not only 
the idea of universality. However, in our modern world, when we look at basic and technical, there have been value judgments ascribed to those things. So uh, I often work with nursing students and I hear a lot of people saying like, I wanna give injections, I wanna do wound care, I wanna put in a catheter. And those are like the really sexy activities, if you will, that they want to engage with. But if you don't feed someone or wash someone or support someone to mobilize, that person will not have good outcomes. And if you've ever tried to feed another adult, if you haven't, I suggest you um, find a friend or your partner and give it a go feeding them supper, see how it goes. It's extremely difficult to do. The other thing is that under these physical activities, there's all kinds of other stuff going on. So I may be washing someone, but I'm probably talking to them. I'm assessing their cognition. I am providing emotional support. I'm asking about discharge planning. I'm inspecting their skin. I'm assessing their motor control and their motor coordination. All of those things are happening as that bath is going on. So what has happened is the things that are considered basic are getting delegated to healthcare assistants, sometimes family members, because it's like those things are basic, anybody can do them. Whereas the technical stuff is what the RNs hold on to, whereas other members of the care team, like um, licensed practical nurses or nursing assistants, nurses, nursing associates, whatever the terminology might be in your area, um, they are getting delegated the quote unquote basic things. So what that means is then you get a hierarchy of who is in closer contact with the patient. And there's research to say that in hospitals, the people who touch the patients the most are lower status. So we'll often see something that my colleagues have referred to as the cappuccino effect. So the people who are doing a lot of the physical labor and spending a lot of time close to the patient are black or brown people. And the people who are at the top, the people who are running the hospital doing the high status job, they are all white. So hence the cappuccino. And that's a bit of a crude way of explaining this, but please understand that I'm trying to illustrate how there can be a racial gradient in terms of how this work is being conducted. So you get like a white nurse is out on the helipad taking in the patient that's been airlifted in, whereas the black nurse is the one who is um, helping Mrs. Jackson get her slippers on. So we ascribe value to different kinds of physical labor based on what that labor includes. But that's not really fair because all of that labor is necessary for survival. So I could talk about this quite a bit, but I hope that's a brief overview of physical labor. So now we're going to move to the next, which is emotional. So emotional labor is defined as using your emotions and your emotional expression to create a therapeutic environment and being paid to do so. So when you come home and you find out that your partner has not taken the chicken out of the freezer and you need to feed the kids in 10 minutes and there is no food even within a reaching distance <laughs> that is not frozen, you might also have to regulate your emotions and regulate your emotional expression. But the difference is for nurses, we are paid to do this. And while everyone has to do some degree of emotional labor, this is often linked with caring and compassion. And nurses have spent a lot of time staking claim over caring and compassion in healthcare. The problem is that we have seen a trend that this is not something people are willing to pay for. It is expected but it is not built into funding structures, patient allocation, that type of thing. So people want this and they expect this, but they're not willing to pay for it and build it into policy. However, when nurses are not doing effective emotional labor, they're very quick to be criticized. So you've probably heard a physician say they don't have good bedside manner, but they're smart, so they're a good doctor. 
I have never, ever heard someone say about a nurse, that nurse doesn't have good bedside manner, but it's okay because they're really smart and they're saving my life. Nurses are expected to do emotional labor, and if we are not, we are not considered good nurses, regardless of anything else that's going on. So we see emotional labor when nurses do things like they're panicking inside, but you try and have a calm face and, you know, proceed in a way that does not alarm the patient. So whatever you're feeling inside, you modify your emotional projection for the service of the patient to create a therapeutic environment. The patient may also say something really shocking to you, but you don't react like, oh my gosh. You react like, okay, tell me more about that. Um, these activities are difficult. They, are, they create burden for nurses, but we're not taught a lot about how to do this. Um, and this burden isn't recognized. So this, so emotional labor is work that has been studied widely, and it's found that this is expected of nurses, but there's no support or education to help it happen. So moving on to cognitive labor, this is a concept that I have created based on research that touched on different aspects of cognitive labor, but what I've done is brought it together and unify it under a concept of cognitive labor to put it on a par with the other things that nurses are doing, like emotional and physical labor. So um, you can infer how I feel about the fact that in 2020, I have to say nurses are smart and we do a lot of thinking as part of our jobs. But here we are, so I hope that cognitive labor is a concept people will adopt and use to try and articulate what it is that nurses do. So cognitive labor falls into two major categories. One of them is learning and like a developmental learning arc. So that's where we get things like Benner's novice to expert theory or you know, looking at nursing education and the process of continuing education and those types of things. So that's one piece. The other main piece of cognitive labor is looking at something called the cognitive stack. And this is one of my favorite things ever because it helped explain so much in my life. So if you think about when you may go to the grocery store and um, on your way there, you're like, okay, I finished work. I need to pick up milk. Um, I think I also need this. You know, we need something for Jennifer's lunch. And at school tomorrow, they have to have uh, pink shirt day. So we need to have a pink shirt and this and that. And that little ticker tape that goes in your mind of do this, do that, remember this, remember that. That is all cognitive labor. So this is a very under-recognized part of nursing. And part of the reason I think it has taken us a while to grasp these concepts is that you can't see them and they are hard to explain. So with physical labor, we can watch it, we can count it. That's not that difficult to study, relatively speaking. With cognitive labor, if you ask nurses about this, they'll say, well, I just checked the fridge temperature. And nurses ourselves, we dismiss this kind of thing. But when you have a cognitive stack and checking the fridge temperature is one of 18 things that's in your working memory, it also creates burden and it requires skill. So some studies have found that nurses have up to have an average of 15 things cognitively stacked in their working memory at any one moment. However, if your cognitive stack, if you imagine books being piled up, if your cognitive stack is too high, it falls over. So if you are asked to hold too many things in your working memory, your brain physically cannot do it. So if a nurse is criticized or potentially written up by the college because they forgot to give a medication, it's not so much that they forgot. It could be because their cognitive stack was too high and their brain wasn't able to process all of that information. So when we start talking about cognitive labor, it completely changes the conversation from looking at individual's fault and did you remember or not, to how high is the cognitive load in your area 
And were you able to safely manage all of those things? We also see every nurse I know has a piece of paper in their pocket. That is where that's called an artifact in safety science. And that piece of paper is where you write down things to help free up space in your cognitive stack. So for me, if it was written on the paper, I didn't have to hold it in my working memory. And that was a strategy that without even realizing I was using to manage my cognitive stack. So taking together cognitive, um, cognitive stacking, things like critical thinking, learning, reflecting, judgment, all of that fits together under cognitive labor. And it's difficult, it has to be taught, and it also has to be supported in the workplace in order to be done safely and effectively. And the final piece of the model as, as is now is organizational labor. So organizational labor refers to activities that nurses do to move patient trajectories through the healthcare system and also to keep the system itself running. So these tasks, I wish I had known about cognitive labor when I was a student, or excuse me, organizational labor when I was a student, because I didn't know how to do this. And then when I got to clinical practice independently, I sucked at it. And it took me a long time to catch up because I had never heard anyone talk about this as part of nursing work. So organizational labor is making phone calls, getting towels, checking fridge temperatures, checking the crash cart, um, making sure that the doctor has signed off on that form for the CT scan, doing the screening for metal before an MRI. All of those things are organizational labor. They're, they can be really easy to dismiss, like, oh, I just made a phone call. But you knew who to phone, what to say, what to ask for, and probably presented a possible solution. So if I call the pharmacy, that takes skill. It takes skill to call the pharmacy properly. And I'm sure that the pharmacy can tell tales of nurses who have not called them properly. So it's one thing to say, hey, do you have any vitamin D in stock? We ran out of our ward stock, we need more. Versus, I need epinephrine up here now. We have used up three crash cards worth and I need more syringes. Send them now. That conveys two completely different kinds of messages. And nurses know how to adjust their tone, adjust their language, and all of that kind of thing to get things done. And that is skilled work. And nurses spend up to 30% of their time doing organizational labor. But most people think that this is the stuff that gets in the way of our work, such as like doing a discharge summary is something that gets in the way of being a nurse. But if we do a discharge summary well, it can improve a whole patient trajectory. It can help someone go to the community, they can get safer care there, they can have a better discharge home, and the impact, like the ripples of that, go much farther than just filling out the discharge summary. If the discharge summary just says stable, DC, um, a you know, times three with wife, then that gives no information to the community and there's so much that can fall through the cracks in that transition with care. So I really hope that nurses can start to see organizational labor as part of their work, not something that gets in the way of their work, because we need to be able to articulate that this is happening and also be credited and paid for this type of work that we do. So when we bring these all together, we can see that there are lots of different things that are happening that nurses are doing that they are not necessarily, um, that are not necessarily visible. And people take for granted that this stuff is happening because if a physician thinks about something and says, you know what, we were going to start Ramipril but because of the higher creatinine, I don't want to do that. I'm going to change my mind and do something else. In order for that to happen, the physician has to tell someone. They have to write it. They have to communicate it to the pharmacy. Like there's a chain of events that has to happen for that decision to take effect. 
So everyone knows that that physician has made that decision. However, if a nurse is putting in an intravenous and you say, okay, um, this is going to have to be in for a while. I'm going to try and avoid ACF because the person will be bending their arm and it'll wreck the intravenous right away. So looking at the veins, uh, they have a fistula, fistula on one side, can't use that side at all. Let's look at the other side. Um, there's good vein here. If I put one in the hand, that's more painful and it can interfere with hand hygiene. So let's go for mid-arm. I know that in mid-arm, there's these veins. I'm going to use this gauge. I'm going to put it here. There's a whole lot of thinking that has gone into that decision. However, what gets documented is uh, 20 gauge IV put in left a, you know, left vein, this arm, this vein, this, you know, flushed patent, etc. Done. You don't get, you don't get to see the process that led up to that decision. So therefore, people take for granted that it's happening and they don't recognize its existence. So this is why I want to raise awareness among nurses about these different kinds of labor, particularly among students, so that we can say that when you get to clinical practice, it's not just the injections, it's not just the wound care, it's all of these different kinds of labor that come together that make nursing care and you need to know how to do all of them. I would also say that um, I presented the model this way for clarity of understanding. I'm not suggesting that the work is 25% in four different quadrants. I'm also not suggesting that they're exclusive. I think this all happens at the same time, lots of times, and depending on the role you have, excuse me, you might have different degrees of different things. So I am a researcher and an educator. I have huge amounts of cognitive and organizational labor. And as well, when I'm working with students, I display a lot of emotional labor but I don't have a ton of physical labor in my job. It's not that there's none, but there's much less. And that's very different than when I worked in intensive care. I had a way higher amount of physical labor there. So I would argue that nurses do all of these things in all of their work. It's just they might do them to different degrees. So just taking into account that this, this visual is not meant to be it's meant to be illustrative. It's not meant to be a scientific diagram. So when we come back looking at nursing work through this modern model, we can see that it's very complex and skilled and a lot is happening that you may not be seeing. Also, nursing work is much more than patient care. Uh, I've heard so many times that Nurses have to check the fridge temperature and that just gets dismissed. But now we're living in an era where we have vaccines that need ultra cold storage and temperature is suddenly very, very important. And this is something that nurses have been managing in medications for decades, but it's never been something we've been credited with as a skill. So this shows that what we do keeps the whole healthcare system running in addition to providing care for individual patients. So what does this mean? We need to think about staffing ratios. Often patients are allocated based on census, acuity, or both. So everybody in this area gets four patients. Um, everybody in this area gets six, or we've done an acuity tool and you're getting the patients with this acuity. So it is good to include considerations about patients when we're allocating staffing, but nowhere in there is the checking the fridge temperature, the arranging porters, the things that make the whole system keep churning, the interprofessional rounds, all of those kinds of things, things that are not necessarily patient associated. It completely disregards all of that work. So the nurses are trying to shoehorn that work into what they're doing and you end up doing like 130% of a role, but the staffing is based only on the patients. So it doesn't take into account all that other stuff. 
We also need to think about competencies and job descriptions. If we're telling, if we're asking that nurses create an environment where care can take place, such as managing a ward, making sure the conditions on a ward and the equipment and the supplies are all adequate, we need to count that into the job description and talk about you're going to have to do cognitive labor, you're going to have to do organizational labor and own it right up front so that it's clear all the different things that nurses are bringing to their work. Um, I alluded to this before, when we think about errors with cognitive labor, we need to look at errors in a different way. So if our working environment is a shambles, it's really unfair to blame errors on individual nurses. Because if the environment is so chaotic that you can't provide good cognitive labor and emotional labor because your cognitive stack is too high or because you're so emotionally exhausted that you can't do any more emotional presentation, then I would argue that those nurses are not responsible for some of the things that might happen at an individual level. Now, this is really difficult, and I appreciate that this is controversial to say that nurses and I'm not saying nurses aren't in control of their actions. What I am saying is we need to think about the environment and the situations we are putting people in and ask how those affect their ability to perform labor. So when we come back to our question, I propose that nurses care for patients and we sustain health systems because all of those types of labor taken together mean that we are keeping the whole thing running and we should talk about our work that way and we should own that and we should get paid for that because that's what's really happening. So here are my references. These are some main authors in all of these other areas. Um, of course there's loads of references in my PhD and you're welcome to look at those as well. Uh, I'm grateful for the funding I received to do this research. And you can learn more on my website. But I encourage you, reflect on your last shift or the last day that you were at work. Think about what you actually did and think about how you talk about it. And I never want to hear, I just da 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 da, da ever again. Um, because nursing is skilled, nursing is difficult, and we deserve to be respected and supported in a way that recognizes that. Thank you very much.